So Chris Wilcox, he's a leading economist and analyst of the world wool market. He has 26 years of experience in analysing the global wool industry, has spoken at over 200 conferences all around the world, has several roles as we speak in the industry. He's the principal of Poimena Analysis, and I got that right, I've been practising. Executive Director of the National Council of Wool Selling Brokers of Australia, and there's been a bit of innovation on that end of things that you can talk about. Uh, Non-Executive Director of the Australian Wool Testing Authority, is the Chairman of the Market Intelligence Committee of the International Wool Textile Organisation, amongst others, and he's the form formerly the Chief Economist of the Woolmark Company, which is um, back in the day when I first met Chris, um, when I was supported through that organisation to do my PhD. So, Chris Wilcox, thank you very much. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Jason, and thank you everybody for being here. It's a I'm delighted to be here in Bendigo for the Best Wool, Best Lamb uh, Conference, the 10th. Today, what I want to talk to you about, and tell you a tale about two markets, the Merino wool market and the crossbred wool market. This tale has some triumphs. It has some disappointments. has some joy. has some sadness. It's got six chapters, as you can see here, and I'll go through each chapter. And being an economist, of course this, this tale has lots of charts and figures and so on, so please bear with me. So first, chapter one, prices. Let's start at the start. And this chart shows a contrast between merino wool prices and crossbred wool prices. The chart on the right hand side is for Australia and you can see that merino wool prices, particularly superfine merino prices in the last 12, 18 months have gone through the roof and exceeded the peaks we saw back in 2011. 21 micron prices have risen but 28 micron wool prices are down. But the big declines for on, on crossbred wool are the broader wools out of New Zealand and of the UK. And that's the chart on the left hand side. Your right hand side, sorry. Um, there's been a 30% drop in those prices. And we had at the uh, International Wool Textile Organisations Congress in Harrogate in the UK, we had representatives from the UK and New Zealand and, and I must say, there's a fair bit of sadness going on in those two countries about their wool prices. One thing to keep in mind in terms of the, uh, those chart, the scale, the scale on the right, on your left, goes up to 2,200 cents. Scale for New Zealand and the UK only goes to 700. So just keep that in mind. So prices are very different. What this has meant in terms of the price relativities between fine wools, super fine wools and the broader wools, 21s and, and so on, is that we see a significant widening of that price differential. And you can see 16.5 and 18 micron wools there, 57% uh, above 21 micron wool now, 45% for 18 micron. And that's well above what we saw back through the uh, two, 2015, 2000, uh, and throughout most of the time from 2015 back through to about 2007. So we've seen that recovery in those price differentials for superfine wools. And part of the story is why have we seen those, those rises in the price differentials? And I'll talk about that a little bit later. The other thing is that we're seeing is that superfine wool is outperforming other fibres. You can see the percentage change between May of this year and May of last year. You can see it's up 50% year on year in May. Compare that with other fibres, even cotton. Cotton has risen quite strongly, but the broader wools New Zealand broadwool in particular, a massive decline. 
what this has meant is that we're seeing that uh, the price relativity between merino wool and other fibres has risen. In fact, what we've seen over the last three decades is a steady rise in the average of the price relativity. To me, while this in the past has been a key measure, to me that is no longer a key measure of what's driving merino wool prices. For crossbred wool, I think it is a driver. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing a decline in crossbred prices. Now, as an aside, we are seeing some differences, and I was asked to comment about these trend towards shearing more frequently, six to nine months. So this is a bit of an aside to the tail. And this chart shows what's happened to, to the price differentials between 90 mil length of merino wool compared with 50 and 60 mil lengths. So more frequent shearing. You can see that uh, the price differential back in 2012 was sitting at around about 30%. That dropped quite rapidly to about 3 or 4% for the 50 mil. But more recently, in the last 18 months, it's gone back out again to around about a 20% discount between 90 mil, so a full season's worth of shearing, versus, say, a six five, six, no, oh, sorry, six, seven, eight, nine months of shearing. And I'll talk a little bit later about what's driving those discounts. So I want to chapter two, production and supply. World wool production has been remarkably stable since around about 2007, 2008. There's been a bit of ups and downs as you can see by the last three years in terms of the 2016, 2017 and 2018 years production. A lot of that's driven by Australia. Keep in mind that Australia produces about 23% of the world's wool, about 60% of the wool that goes into apparel, 70% of the world merino wool and 85% of the world's superfine merino wool. So what happens here in Australia in terms of production does have a significant effect on world wool production. But it's been very stable at around about 70-year lows across the world. And for Australia, last season's production, 2015-16, was at the lowest level since 1923-24. We've seen a bit of a recovery this season largely because of the fantastic seasonal conditions we saw right, th right across the country for, for growing fleece wool. And here's where the tale starts to change. And it tries, starts to explain why there's differences between the prices for merino wool and the prices for crossbred wool. This chart shows that over the last seven, eight years, there's been a rising gap between the production of wool used in interior textiles, so the broader crossbred wool, and wool used in apparel, typically merino wool plus some other wools. You've seen that rising gap. And that's because we're seeing right around the world, here in Australia, as you would all well know, but right around the world, a shift away from sheep for wool towards sheep for meat, dri driven by the demand for protein. You'll all be well versed in that, but we're seeing that impact in terms of the type of wool being produced around the world. And as a result, supply is one of the answers to why we're seeing this, this rise in merino prices and a decline in crossbred prices with added supply for crossbred and lower supplies for merino. And it's particularly, we're seeing that particularly in superfine wool. Now this, these two charts show world wool production, world superfine wool production in total, that's the, the blue bars on the, uh, 
on your, I think it's right, left, and the shares of the, of the total. And you can see the shares are a bit under 6% currently. But in particular, you can see the rise in production around the world from about 2010 right through to about 2014. And that, you will see, is driven by the rise in production of super fine wool, 18.5 microns and finer, in Australia. But in the last two or three years, we've seen that come back. So we've seen that production drop. So that's helped support the prices for superfine wool because, as I'll talk about a bit later, I'm absolutely convinced there's been a strong rise in demand throughout the last decade for superfine wool. But this rise in production that we saw in the back half of the, uh, the 2000s and into, into the 2010s in Australia swamped the rise in demand. And that's why we saw the price differentials narrow so sharply. We're now seeing that rebalancing. Back to the sideline story of Prem Shorn Wool. This chart shows the increase or the change in production, both in terms of total and in terms of the share of Prem Shorn Wool. It's actually auction data and, and uh, data from AWEX showing the Prem Shorn Wool. And you can see the sharp rise since around about spring 2015. We're up to around about a bit under 12% is now that, that prem shorn wool rather than a full season shorn wool. About 2015 it started rising. And remember this chart, how we saw at around about Mid-2015 was when the, the discounts were the lowest. They started widening out. So supply is one reason we're seeing, and probably the main reason, we're seeing the discounts started to, starting to widen again. Now, you might think, well, what's this wool used in? Well, I've asked a couple of my, my friends in, this, in the uh, spinning industry. So one friend... Uh, in a company called Xinao. Xinao is the biggest Chinese-owned wool spinner. Uh, it uh, produces mainly knitting yarn, yeah, uh, knitting yarn. And uh, Zhou Xiaotian tells me, I asked him the question, he tells me that in his view, there's no reason why the market can't absorb this added supply because it, it gets used in particularly knitting yarn for flatbed knitting. So your standard uh, knitwear jumpers rather than circular knit. Circular knit, knit needs a bit longer wools, but for flatbed knitting, for normal jumper, jumpers, it get, can easily be used in that kind of market. And there's a big market for that. And that's been doing very well in the last five, ten years. But I suspect what we're seeing is just buyers trying to be able to put these, these shorter wools into batches, shipments, for processing. And that's just trying to, that, that, trying to do that rebalancing. So that's chapter two, production. What about on the demand side? What's happening on the demand side around the world? Let's look, first look at raw wool demand, chapter three. Well, again, we're seeing a tale of growth for exports from the countries that typically produce merino wools. Australia, Argentina, South Africa, particularly Australia. This is in volume terms, keep in mind. And you can see that the uh, exports from those three countries are either steady or growing, notably from Australia. But exports from New Zealand produces mainly crossbred wool. Only 6% of, of the New Zealand wool clip is merino. The rest of it is fine or broad crossbred wool. And you can see the massive drop in exports from New Zealand. You can also see the massive drop 
and exports from Uruguay. Uruguay is mainly, mainly produces corridor wool with a little bit of merino wool. So again, this is part of the story. This is what's driving the differential between merino wools and crossbred wool. And for Australia, this is by micron category, both in terms of volume and value. And you can see the growth in exports of 19 micron and finer and 21 to 23 micron wools. But at the same time, the drop in exports of those broader crossbred types. What we're seeing is, particularly China, now you'd all be aware that China from Australia takes 70 to 75% of Australia's wool. It takes 60% of New Zealand's wool. It takes around about 65% of Uruguay's wool. It takes a significant portion of the UK's exports and a significant portion of the South African and Argentina's exports. China's what's driving this trend. And this chart shows what's happening with China's imports. And you can see that its imports from Australia and South Africa are on a rising trend year on year. In contrast, its imports from New Zealand and Uruguay and others, and others includes the UK, are on a steady decline. They don't want China's mills do not want crossbred wool at the moment. They want merino wool. That's what they're buying. That's what they're buying. And I'll get to why that they're doing that shortly. Chapter 4, wool textile industry conditions. Now, I mentioned that the International Wool Textile Organisation had its annual congress in the UK in May. And in the lead-up to the Congress every year, the Market Intelligence Committee does a survey of, of countries around the world asking for feedback about what the wool textile industry in each country is doing. It's not about hard and fast numbers, it's about sentiment. How do you feel things are going? And we ask questions about activity levels in different sectors. We ask about stock levels in different sectors. And the next chart, I must warn you before I begin, is it's, it's a bit of a spaghetti chart, so be, please bear with me. This chart shows production activity levels in each sector. And it's judged according to how they, they feel activity levels are, whether they're very good or whether they're good or normal or poor or very poor. So a scale of one to five. And you can see a variety of lines. But the point is that for the most recent period, so for the March 2016, and then looking forward to 2000, the end of 2000, sorry, March 2017, and looking forward to the end of 2017, conditions are generally pretty good. Generally pretty good. Good in the early stage processing sector, good in the knitting sector, in the weaving sectors, improving. Then on the uh, then knitting, doing very well. Remember I talked about knitting? It's doing very well. Interior textiles, though, not, very, not all that good. So it gives you a bit of a hint, the way things are feeling. I, I talked about the raw wool demand and the crossbred wool not being bought. Its interior textile sector is struggling a bit at the moment. The other thing that came out of the survey results is we ask about stocks and, and stocks held at each sector through the chain. Early stage processing, spinning, weaving, garment making. And we asked about how the stock levels were on, and in general there was a response saying that they were under control. In interior textiles, perhaps a little bit high. But I'll get back to that a little bit later when I talk about all the results coming out of the International Wool Textile Organisation's annual congress. So in terms of textile industry conditions, mills around the world are feeling reasonably confident, which is good news. 
Chapter 5, the consumer. Well, this part of the tale is very mixed. There's some good things. There are some not so good things. First of all, conf consumer confidence around the world. It's rising or at, at levels we haven't seen for many years. This shows consumer confidence in the US, in the EU, in Korea, in China and in Japan. And you can see the blue line, the US, that's at levels we haven't seen since 2001. Remarkably, the US consumer is tremendously confident at the moment. In the EU, similarly, we're seeing levels we haven't seen since before the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. It's a bit more mixed in Asia, quite good in Japan, rebound in South Korea, although I was talking to David Michelle from uh, Michelle's last week. He's only just recently been in Korea and he said consumer confidence in South Korea has just gone through the floor in the last month or so because of the, because of the problems with North Korea. So he said there is some concerns there in Korea. The, oh, by the way, I should have said these countries collectively... US, European Union, China, Japan, Korea, account for about 65% of the world's consumption of wool at retail, as garments, as, as carpets, as uh, in, upholstery fabrics, as curtains. So about 60, 65%. So this matters. So consumer confidence, very good. But US imports of uh, clothing has declined. Regardless of fibre, it's declined. So consumers are very confident, but the importers of clothing into the US, say, for the retailers, aren't all that confident about being able to sell those products. What about the longer term? Well, let's, before we talk about the longer term, Let's just have a look at a picture about where does wool go around the world. And trade data is the only thing we've got to be able to measure where the consumption is, really. And you can see that knitwear accounts for a significant portion of the world trade. Men's suits, men's overcoats, men's trousers and jackets, also a big portion. Women's overcoats are important. Other women's, low. We've actually lost a huge share in women's wear over the last 20 years. Huge share. We're just not competing. In terms of growth opportunities for wool, particularly merino wool, where, where we see, I see the, the growth opportunities are in knitwear, both in terms of traditional knitwear, but also in terms of, of uh, next to skin wear, the active wear, the kind of product you saw last night at the end of the fashion show. Strong growth, it's only a small market, but it says strong growth, and they're fantastic products. I wear it. I wear it when I run. I wear it when I cycle. Just fantastic, and and more and more people are finding that. The mainstay men's wear will continue to be a mainstay, as will women's coats. But uh, but there will be decline in women's wear generally. In terms of the IWTO Congress results, let me just talk a bit about some of the feedback that came out of that. And there's quite a bit of information on here. There were some positives and some negatives. On the merino side, it was generally very positive. But for crossbred wool, there was concerns about whether merino, uh, whether crossbred wool had lost markets to other fibres, notably acrylic, in the heavier outer uh, women's coats, in particular in China. There's also been an issue about uh, double-faced woolen fabric that was an absolute craze throughout 2015 and into 2016 in China. It was massive and stupid. And, it, and there was way too much stock of that product built up. And they're still trying to sell it. And, that was, and you, uh, the wool that was used in that often was crossbreed wool. One thing I was asked to make a comment on is about mulesing. 
and there was, at, at the IWTO Congress, mulesing is clearly a negative. And when I talk to mills around the world, particularly in, even in China, even in China, they say they're getting increasing demand for, for wool that has been from sheep that is non-mulesed. Non-mulesed. They don't know anything about pain relief. They want non-mules. The retailers and the brands, they want non-mules wool. Now, we've seen an increase in non-mules wool production here in Australia, where it's up to about 9% now. 9%, that's all. So these, these mills are turning to South Africa, Argentina and New Zealand. And keep in mind, New Zealand's only got 6% of its total clippers merino. And Australia is 70% of the world merino clip. So... If they want non-mules wool, it's got to be, they've got to find it from somewhere and unfortunately here in Australia it's, more, it's difficult to do. And as I said, they don't know about pain relief and every time I go to the mills in China, they're, they're talking about it. Not for the Chinese domestic market, it's for the export market and about half of the wool that goes into China is re-exported into US and, and the uh, European Union in particular. One thing I want to finish on is the Dumfries House Declaration, which was discussed and announced at the uh, IWTO Congress. Prince Charles, who's the patron of the Campaign for Wool, hosted the Dumfries House Wool Conference last September. And they, there, was a, there was a declaration made amongst all those 200 people. It's a 10-point declaration and seeking people where the president of the International Wool Textile Organisation, Peter Ackroyd, is seeking signatories to that. And the ten, point, uh, 10 points of the declaration are listed here. I won't go through them all. But I urge you, if you're involved in the wool industry, merino or crossbred, to sign this declaration online. Google search Dumfries House Declaration and you can sign it up on behalf of your businesses. It's, it's important because it, it makes some key points about wool in terms of its sustainability, in terms of its recycling and so on. And because, make no doubt, have no doubt that there's challenge for wool on sustainability from all other fibres, even synthetic fibres, who are promoting the use, the recycling use of synthetic fibres, even though there are more and more problems with synthetic fibres. So please, I urge you to sign that declaration. So it's an unfinished tale, this tale. We've got some answers, but it's still going. And I think that we'll see crossbred wool prices over the next few months start to lift because nothing solves low prices like low prices. We'll see an increased demand in response to these lower prices, I have no doubt. There is wool being built that's been built up in sheds in New Zealand that will need to be flushed out first, but nevertheless I think we'll see an improvement in crossbred prices, although there are some concerns about whether we've lost some markets in crossbred wool. For a merino, we're seeing a strong increase in demand, particularly for that lighter weight next to skin wear. But we've had these very high prices and we've seen cycles in the past. So I would not be surprised to see those merino prices start to come off in the next few months, particularly when we see the spring flush of wool come onto the market. To be continued. Thank you very much. Yeah, well. So thank you very much, much Chris. We, we do have time for some questions and we have some people with um, roving mics, I hope they're about. Um, if you've got a hand that's up near you before you kill all the time, we do have a couple right up the front. Yep, we have one from Terry and then we'll come across uh, whichever order. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, just with the mules, wool and non-mules, do you have any um, comment on where Australia sits in terms of world sheep, uh, in terms of mulesing? So are we the last country that mules sheep or where do we stand <laughs> in that regard? 
um, where it's claimed that Australia is the only country that mules sheep. Uh, South Africa claimed they, did, they don't mules, and New Zealand claim they don't mules, and South, Af and South America claim they don't mules. So it's an Australian problem on that basis. And that's, sorry, not only do they claim, but that's what they recognise. So the mules, when you speak to the mules, they say, oh no, South Africa don't mules, or New Zealand don't mules, or... So it, it's very much an Australian problem. It's yeah. an sorry? Yeah, that's right. And, and as I said, they want non-mules, they don't know anything about pain relief, even though we've seen a big increase in use of pain relief here in Australia. So, so we we'll keep moving, we'll get through a few. Terry? With the growth in prime land production, particularly composite-based, do we have a crossbred wool quality issue more so than the Nova production? In that have we lost um, markets because of the quality of the wool coming off composites yeah. rather than the wool coming off a, a corridor or a first cross you? Um, well, can I say I'm an economist, not a buyer or a wool classer. I did wool classing, as you know, Terry, 30 years ago, but um, I don't think so because I, it's not, it's not an, Australia, an Australian price or demand problem. It's New Zealand and, and uh, UK and, and, uh, and Uruguay. It's, in fact, more so. Than, than it is here in Australia. So I don't think it's a, it's a quality issue at the, at, at the macro level. Lyndon? Uh, yeah. yep. uh, Chris, you mentioned in the Dumfries agreement that you are signing to be, you will be welfare assured. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, yes, it's, there's actually, the International Wool Textile Organisation has a, um, uh, Animal welfare statement that, that signed been signed off by all countries, including Australia, uh, and it's about uh, the five freedoms to do with uh, with sh for sheep. So I can't remember the five freedoms, but it's essentially not no cruelty, uh, adequate supply of water, and, uh, and and so on. So, but it's listed on the IWTO website. Um, it's not about non mules versus mules. If that's the if that's where you're going. But it's about it's about the, uh, the fair the uh, fair treatment of animals. Kate, yep. Yeah, I'm just curious um, how susceptible is the merino industry to oversupply again, given that there was only sort of subtle changes have had a, a big impact currently. Um, I don't think it's subject to oversupply. We we saw with superfine wool. The supply increase, the rapid supply increase we saw on the back of result. Uh, the impact of breeding decisions made 10 years before, and the you know, dry conditions we had back in the back end of the 20, 20, uh, 2000s, that swamped the increase in demand. But one chart I haven't shown is the increase in demand we're seeing in terms of export value. It's been so strong consistently since 1991. Ups and downs as we go, but I don't think we'll have a problem with oversupply. In fact, at the moment, I think, if anything, we've got an undersupply situation, which is not bad for prices. Um. Lyndon? Uh, in regards to the mulesing, is, what, what is the benefit dollar-wise of... In, in yeah, price -wise? Um, there's only been... There's been one study done um, that's reported on the AWI website. Uh, Elizabeth Nolan did the study. It's a econometric study. Um, and she came up with about two or three cents. But talking to buyers, and there are some buyers such as Radar out of Italy, who've got a sustainable wool program. New England wool is linked to that. They, they pay significantly higher premiums for non-mules wool, but there's a number of other uh, issues that they, you need to address. But uh, while the overall market suggests a couple of cents, two or three cents, depending on the microns, there are some key market segments that, uh, or programs that get significant inc significantly higher value. Kate? Okay. Uh, Chris, uh, you've you led on a little bit there before about uh, supply and so forth and uh, of it. Uh, we're starting to see deteriorating uh, weather conditions right across the country in Western Australia, Queensland, New South Wales and parts of Victoria. What would happen if we went into a drought with supply and what would uh, the process's reaction be? And <laughs> well, there'll be two impacts. One is that, as you know, there'll be uh, a bit more hunger farm all around, but uh, more importantly, there'd be uh, presumably, because we've seen the increase this season because of fleece weights, 
Police rates drop back. We're not seeing, I don't see that we're seeing any increase at all in sheep numbers in Australia. So we'll drop back in production and they'll be concerned about that, no doubt. They, they're concerned already about supply out of Australia. When you think about those numbers, about 23% of world wool production, 60% you know, of world apparel wool, 70% of world merino wool, 85% of world superfine wool, they have to be worried about what, what happens here. And, and every, I do a presentation at the Nanjing Wool Market Conference every year, and the Chinese all want, always want to know what's happening to production in Australia. Last one. Chris, if uh, the processors and buyers are, let's say, not aware of uh, pain relief and therefore perhaps not the National Wool Declaration, is there any value to give the industry a bit of breathing space uh, of promoting or promoting global awareness of the National Wool Declaration and the pain relief option? I, I, think, I think there is value in that, but how you do that's a question. And, and, it's, and keep in mind that these demands are coming from the retail side. The retail side and the brand companies and the people who work for those companies know about non-mulesing, know about mulesing. They don't know anything else about it. And you've got to, it's a significant education program and take, will take a fair bit of effort. And in my view, I think it's worth it, but it's, it's still it's a significant... And wool producers Australia are well aware of some of these issues. All right. If we could give a big round of applause for Chris. Thank you. Authorised by Victorian Government, 1 Treasury Place, Melbourne.